Right, so um, hello, as already stated, my name is Dr. Gita Ganesh, and the title of my presentation is Navigating the Increasingly Complex World of Disease Modifying Therapies. And um, here's this boring slide, I have no financial disclosures. So um, my talk today, my goals are to discuss the timeline of disease modifying therapies in the US, identify the factors used to select a disease modifying therapy, discuss how disease modifying therapies are grouped in terms of efficacy, review how a neurologist decides when it is time to change medications, and define the term shared decision making. But first, I have a question for you. Um, I didn't buy my Halloween candy yet, so I don't have any candy for anyone who can answer correctly. So when was the first disease modifying therapy approved for adults with relapsing remitting MS by the Food and Drug Administration? I'm curious if anyone knows the answer. What year? It's 94 is close. I might give it to you because it's like the price is right. I guess you're kind of close. <laughs> so the answer was 1993 and it was interferon beta 1b. So I just want to put some perspective on this because the year 2023 is right around the corner. So if you do your math, you'll note that our first disease modifying therapy for MS is going to be 30 years old. So there might be some people in the room who were diagnosed with MS before the year 1993 that know what it was like when we had very few medications. And there could be someone in the room who is younger than the age of 30 that has no clue what it was like before we had all these medications. And what's even crazier is that when beta serum came out, there was a short supply of it, and there was a lottery to see who could get the medication. So I'm just going to give you an excerpt from an article from 1993, the Pharma Letter. Following the recent approval of beta seron, interferon beta, for relapsing remitting multiple sclerosis in the USA, this company has announced that the distribution of the product will be controlled through a computer lottery, where each patient will be assigned a number. This has arisen because the firm will only be able to supply sufficient quantities of the drug to treat between 12,000 and 20,000 patients in its first year on the market. This means that about 80% of eligible MS sufferers will be unable to obtain access to the drug in the short term. The company estimates that it will not have enough of the drug to treat nearly all eligible patients until 1996. Wow, so not only did the first medicine come out in 93, but we didn't have enough to treat everyone. So we have certainly come a long way. This is a timeline that only goes up to the year 2020. We've had more medications come out since then. And um, this is my next trivia question. We'll see who can figure it out. When was the first oral disease-modifying therapy approved by the US Food and Drug Administration? Twenty fourteen is a little bit too too later. <laughs> two thousand nine is close. I'll go with that one. Oh, did someone say? I don't know. <laughs> I can't hear anyone. Did you say twenty ten? <laughs> okay, that's correct. Twenty ten. Um, so that's amazing. That was fingolimod, also called Jelenia. Um, so we went from nineteen ninety three to twenty ten before we finally got a pill for people. So if you were to look at the National MS Society website right now, you would see that there are 23 total medications, branded and non-branded, for multiple sclerosis for adults with MS. Um, and that's amazing. So a little memory trick I have is that in the year 2023, just think 23, okay? So what complicates things a bit is that the timeline is actually a little bit messy. There have been medications that have been both temporarily and permanently removed as well. So natalizumab was voluntarily removed from the market in 2005. This was by its own pharmaceutical company, and those who remember being on the medicine will know that it was because of a few cases of progressive multifocal leukoencephalopathy, which is a fatal brain infection. Um, and then once they did the monitoring and appropriate uh, work to figure this out, it was then returned to the market under a special prescribing program in 2006. I don't know if anyone remembers Declizumab. It was also called Zembrita. It was FDA approved in 2016, and then it was actually voluntarily withdrawn in 2018 due to cases of a special type of encephalitis in Europe. So we've certainly come a long way. There are 23 options out there. 
So this is kind of a rhetorical question, but is it possible for me as a clinician to go through all 23 options in a typical clinic visit? And the answer is no, it's really not possible. It's not even meaningful to go through all 23 medications. Most of us, our eyes glaze over if we're given like four options. So there's too many options, not enough time. Now the question is, is it possible for me as a clinician to go through only three medications with every patient that walks through the door? Sure, it's possible, but it's not practical. And the reason is because, as we all know in the audience, each person with MS comes to the table with a different set of characteristics. And sometimes you can group those characteristics together and come up with a certain group of medications that might be good for that certain group of patients. So this is where precision medicine comes in. One size does not fit all. So technically, precision medicine means taking to, into account a person's genes, environment, and lifestyle to develop a treatment plan. And it allows us to tailor a treatment to subgroups of patients. Now, some people are actually a little bit nitpicky about the term precision medicine, and they think it should only refer to genetic, molecular, or cellular analyses to find an optimal treatment. And unfortunately, in the world of MS, we're just not there yet. I wish we had a blood test that told people that you can be on medication A, B, and C, but we haven't gotten there yet. Instead, we look at certain characteristics of the patient. So the next few slides, I'm going to talk to you about uh, certain uh, factors that we look at. And the reality is each of these topics is a presentation unto itself. We aren't going to go into very much detail. But for example, your disease course can determine which medications are offered to you. If someone in the audience has primary progressive MS, you're going to be offered a different set of medications than somebody who has a relapsing form of MS. So here's another trivia question. When was the first disease-modifying therapy approved for adults with primary progressive MS by the US Food and Drug Administration? Does anyone know? That's too, too late, <laughs> so we'll think or a little bit earlier. 2017, and I'm sorry, I don't know if I pointed to the right person, but <laughs> it was 2017, and it was ocrelizumab. And um, for example, also, your age can be another factor that determines what medications you're given. So the most basic understanding is if you're a child with MS, you're going to be offered a different set of medications than if you're an adult. And then we already learned from the, uh, later pres the uh, earlier presentation that age in terms of adults can make a difference too. If you're a little bit later on in life, you may be offered a different set of medications, maybe less immunosuppressive than someone who is, say, in their 20s or 30s. Uh, this might be my last trivia question for, for the day. Um, can anyone tell me the year that the first disease-modifying therapy for children with multiple sclerosis was approved by the Food and Drug Administration? It's a harder one. <laughs> and that's okay, because we're all adults here, so I figured we wouldn't know it. But the answer is 2018. I can, can you believe this? 1993 was our first medication, and it took until 2018 before we had the appropriate clinical trials for children with MS. And that medication was fingolimod, also called Gelenia. So if you have an aggressive or disabling uh, disease course, you might be given a different set of medications compared to someone who has a much milder course. Well, what does that mean? So typically we think of people with an aggressive course or those who have multiple relapses per year or they don't recover well from their relapses or they have brainstem lesions, tumefactive lesions, or when you look at their MRIs, they have multiple active lesions on a scan. That person I look at differently than, say, somebody who has maybe one relapse every five years, and when they do have a relapse, they have great recovery. Now, a big topic, again, too big for this presentation, is family planning. If you are a woman of childbearing age that is planning to get pregnant, say, in the next six months to one year, your clinician may offer you a narrower set of options compared to someone who is not planning to get pregnant. Your medical conditions also impact what medications might be offered to you, and there's a long list. For example, if you have heart issues like high blood pressure, arrhythmias, heart failure, if you have active or a prior history of cancer, if you have infectious diseases, if you have liver problems, kidney problems, some people in the audience may have an additional autoimmune disease, for example, lupus, and you're already on an immunosuppressive therapy, adding on an additional immunosuppressive therapy may be problematic. 
If we were to divide options just based on method of administration and just tell people just based on that, this would be the chart. There are self-injections, there are pills, there are infusions, but it doesn't tell the whole story. So for example, in the self-injection class, ofatumumab has a different degree of immune suppression compared to our interferons. In the oral medication class, cladribine, also called Mavenclad, has a different immunosuppressive risk compared to teraflunamide. So just basing it on the method of administration alone doesn't tell you the whole story. Some of the final factors we look at are adherence history. If there's someone in the audience that just has difficulty taking daily medications, your clinician will take that into account and may offer you a medicine that is less frequent in terms of administration. If you have a high JCV index, uh, you may not be offered natalizumab. There are certain antibodies to check for certain medications. And then the biggest headache is actually our insurance, which offers a step therapy. So you have to have tried and failed A and B before you can get to C. And the problem with this insurance therapy, uh, sorry, insurance requirement of step therapy is that sometimes a patient will have to fail a medicine before they can get to their desired medication. I'm gonna change gears a little bit and talk to you about some, some clinicians will offer you a certain set of medications because of their belief in what should be tried first. And so there's two groups of us out there. There's escalation of therapy versus those who go for the early, aggressive, or highly effective therapies first. So we're gonna talk about this. In the escalation of therapy approach, that's where your clinician tends to choose the first line or traditional or standard therapies, and I'll explain that in a little bit. Historically, these were some of the first to be FDA approved. They are considered to have lower reductions in your relapse rate per year. They're often associated with less immune suppression or less side effects, not always. Um, and then what happens is if you fail that medicine, meaning if you have radiological or clinical breakthrough, you're then moved on to the next higher efficacy in terms of medications. So now that I've kind of given you that overview, I'd like to tell you there's pros and cons to this escalation of therapy method. The pros being is that we may actually uh, reduce the um, exposure to immune suppression to issues with cancer surveillance to infectious diseases if we go for these lower efficacy medications first, but the con is that you might be exposing the patient to a greater chance of having a relapse. So this is a, a chart that gives an overview of what we think about when we think about lower efficacy versus higher efficacy. I'm gonna go ahead and tell you that there are, if there are a bunch of neurologists in the room, we would be debating it for hours, but there's been a general consensus on this. You'll note on the lower efficacy column that these tend to be some of our earlier medications that came out, the interferons, glutirmer acetate. There's an oral medication option there called teraflunamide. If we were looking at mid-range efficacy, we would be thinking of our S1P receptor modulators. Fingolimod has already been mentioned in this uh, talk. Fumarates are another one. If we were looking at the higher efficacy disease-modifying therapies, in general, it tends to be our infusion therapies, natalizumab, ocrelizumab, alemtuzumab, but there's also a self-injection, ofatumumab, and a pill, cladribine. So now that you've seen that chart, let's talk about that second group of clinicians out there who tend to go straight for those highly effective therapies. I'll just go back and have you remember which ones those were in that um, column called the higher efficacy column here. So why would somebody do this? We're choosing a disease-modifying therapy with a higher reduction in the annualized relapse rate, so your relapse rate per year. It's sometimes referred to as an aggressive or intensive approach, but it's often associated with greater immunosuppression more side effects, increased cancer risk, or greater chance of developing another autoimmune disease, because when you mess with the immune system, you might cause something else to take place. But the pro here is that you could lead to less disability later in life. So here we, again, we've got pros and cons to each approach. Well, which approach should we take here? The truth is that smaller cohort studies are suggesting that we should go for the higher efficacy approach first, but what we really need is this clinical trial that's looking at patients over the long run that's randomized and it's giving us a lot of data. And actually, there's two clinical trials that are going on right now, Treat MS and Deliver MS. So Treat MS comes from Johns Hopkins and the abbreviation is on the slide here, and we are actually one of the clinical sites for it. Deliver MS comes from Cleveland Clinic. So in Treat MS, a newly diagnosed patient is being randomized to one of two groups. 
the uh, lower efficacy um, options versus the higher efficacy options. And then we're following the patients out over several years, looking at their disability uh, status scores. We're looking at health-related quality of life, fatigue, patient satisfaction. In Deliver MS, there's a little bit of a different angle on this. Again, patients are being randomized to that lower efficacy group versus the higher efficacy group, but they're focusing more on MRI factors. And in particular, they're looking at brain volume loss from zero to 36 months and other health-related quality of life parameters. So we're looking forward to the information uh, coming from these two studies. Again, just want to point out that uh, Norton is part of the TREAT MS trial, and we're still looking for patients for it. It's going to give us a lot of good data. So regardless of which medicine you're first put on, why would somebody switch to a different disease-modifying therapy? There's some obvious reasons for that. For example, I can't tolerate the medicine. There's too many side effects if you can't tolerate the method of administration, if there are concerning lab abnormalities like white blood cell count or elevated liver enzymes, if you're on natalizumab and your JCV index goes too high, there's a concern for this PML, that fatal brain infection. But there are other factors that your clinician is looking at when it comes to your MRI, your neurological exams. And again, this is where we're going to divide up those clinicians once more, looking at how strict they are at those parameters. So I'm going to talk to you about two terms, NIDA and NIDA. Okay. So NIDA, no evidence of disease activity. They don't want to see anything, right? This is actually an endpoint in clinical trials, but in reality, many neurologists are using it to try to make treatment decisions. So here's the parameters that they're looking at. They want to see no new radiolog radiological activity on MRIs. That means no new or enlarging T2 lesions, no T1 gadolinium enhancing lesions. They want to see no progression in disability, no clinical relapses, and there's a fourth parameter, and that is including measures of brain atrophy and cognitive testing. So there are pros and cons to this approach as well. It's, it's very strict. Uh, it might force people to go up to that higher efficacy medication a little bit quicker. The reality is we don't know which of those parameters weighs more than the other ones. For example, should we weigh more heavily MRI information or clinical relapse data? We're not sure just yet. And the other thing that um, you might have noticed here is that some of these are not easy to do in a community clinical setting. For example, ongoing cognitive testing and looking at measures of brain atrophy. The other uh, uh, group out there is called minimal evidence of disease activity, or MEDA. And that defines a minimal amount of disease activity during treatment that can be tolerated without exposing patients to long-term disability. So this is not well defined. You're going to see different clinicians in the community have different standards here. But typically, it's no more than two minor clinical relapses over a two-year period before they switch the medication, or no, or no more than two new lesions over a two-year period, or no more than one major relapse. And why do people still follow MEDA? And the reason is because minimal clinical or MRI activity may not be linked with worse outcomes. So we still don't have all the data yet on how quickly we should move people on to the next medication. So regardless of uh, whichever pathway is taken, uh, one key uh, topic that we all um, learn as we go through this process as clinicians is shared decision making. And that's where the clinicians educate the patient on treatment options, the patient voices their concerns, and after the discussion of options, it's the patient that makes that informed decision. And then the clinician's role is to provide ongoing education, and that's where I show people their MRIs, we go through lab abnormalities and make sure it's still safe to be on the medication. Uh, one of the best parts about being at this comprehensive MS center is that I have the ability to pull in the nurse navigator if I feel like the talk isn't going well, or we also have a pharmacist down the hall. So we have a team approach to trying to help a patient um, decide on their disease-modifying therapy. So um, I'm going to end with this picture. I was trying to figure out if there was like a metaphor here. Um, it's fall, and the leaves are going to start changing. I think they are. This is at Brown State Park in Indiana. And so um, I kept trying to pull over to the side of the road and take these pictures of these leaves. And then I would go home because it was so beautiful in my head. When I went home, and the pictures, I just they didn't seem to capture that beauty that I saw out there. And I kept thinking, well, this is kind of like being in a room with a person. It seems like we had that moment where we understood what topic and what medications we were talking about, but sometimes people will go home and they kind of forget it and they sort of question what they were um, 
thinking, and that happens all the time. You make a decision and then you question it later on because maybe your perspective changes. Um, so I just want you to know that it's always an ongoing conversation with the clinician. We always have uh, a back line to our nurse navigator. If a patient has a question about the medicine, they change their mind, and, and um, it's just an active process overall. Uh, so thank you. <laughs> Thank uh you. -huh.